This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. First things first, everyone remember to support the strikes and donate to the community entertainment fund. Link in description. It's going to be there. Do that. Okay. What the fuck were we talking about? Uh, I'll just say once again, thanks to our patrons for supporting us. I'm going to just try and say that more often. Because I appreciate it constantly, and I don't think I say it enough. Did, did we did we check to see if we have new patrons? Did we actually remember to do that? Uh, I, I have not gotten any emails for new patrons, but I haven't checked. Okay, okay. So today is a broad spectrum. Thank you, patrons. Yes. We love you. Right. Yeah, we, we are going to try to be more appreciative, because you are all awesome. So, there's a line in this chapter which I think kind of summarizes everything about it, where Jordan says, At this rate, half of the Aes Sedai in the camp would be crowded into the pavilion before too long. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. You would have half of them. Just like, there must be... So many names. Ridiculous. They're not all worth talking about. Most of them aren't worth talking about. There are, there may be some hidden gems in there for what the Aes Sedai are up to in terms of the order they show up, or what they're doing, or who's whispering in a corner, but there was nothing I could identify as particularly vital, except for a few things related specifically to Egwene that I think we'll go over. But the listing of all of the various sisters in all the various, uh, I should say sitters of the various halls gets into a lot of detail that I don't think we need to go too deeply into, because these are just people who exist in their ajas. Yeah, it's uh, scenery, I said I. There's so many yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. It's ridiculous. It's, it's like when he lists a bunch of different trees or, like, different kinds of boats, but it's individual sitters in the hall or whatever, you know? And I really don't have a whole lot to say about this chapter so there's a couple of bits of information that are very vital from this chapter but it's surrounded by a gelatin like structure that's kind of (laughs) icky and gooey and gross that we have to reach through to pull those nuggets out so that's what we're doing today um forgive us if we don't talk about all of the various eyes to die and what the implications of them being there are but before we have to eat our gelatinous gooey dinner, we have a tasty, tasty dessert. Yes. So this is my favorite POV of the entire Winter's Heart Chapter 35 cleansing chapter. This POV is my favorite. Mogedian at the end. It's just mm, so tasty. It's also one of the most information heavy POVs about the cleansing. Like we learn a lot about how it ends basically like what this is the big been the big question right if Rand starts cleansing the source if he starts dumping the taint into a real world position on the surface of the planet how big is that ball of taint going to get and will it crack the planet open yeah it's the it's the particle accelerator of its day is it gonna make a black hole (laughs) I was going to say it's the Oppenheimer of the day. Like, is it going to set the atmosphere on fire, right? Like, Yeah, okay, that's actually a more relevant comparison, given what just happened in the real world movie people existence. Is Mogedian the Barbie of the Barbie Oppenheimer? <laughs> you know, like... Yeah, we, we can, we can, all, I have not seen either movie yet, though. I was being told in vehement terms that I definitely need to see Barbie. And I have every plan to see Barbie. I just haven't gotten around to it because it's, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. No, and uh, this classic line, she thought if she survived this, she would never feel fear again. From Mogedian, the spider, the yeah. one who feels the most fear. We've been in her head with Nynaeve feeling that ball of fear. And just like this, this is what breaks her. Yeah. Kind of impressive. It's- Amazing. I I love it so much. She's I agree with you, Zul, in chat. Um Mogedian is not my favorite Forsaken, but I completely love reading her. She is maybe the most fun to read of the Forsaken, although she is like on the whole not my favorite of the thirteen, if that makes sense. 
So I'll say something controversial. One of the reasons Nynaeve is so popular is because of her antithesis with Mogedian. She has a Forsaken that she fights with on a regular basis that they keep coming back. And this is more of a bad guys make the good guys. A good bad guy really, like, who do we remember in the best hero movies? The bad guys, right? And Mogedian is Nynaeve's nemesis in a way that... Not many other characters in this series really, like, you can say the golem is Matt's or maybe Demondred, but it's just not consistent enough, you know? Uh, Perrin's got Grendel after him for a while. I mean, you can s- kind of say Randon Ishi. Well, Perrin is Slayer. Yeah, Perrin is Slayer, sure. Perrin and Slayer, at, but it's such a slow burn that, and then Randon Ishi, but yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I don't think that's a controversial take at all because. Mogedian is the most like human and long arc of all of those comparisons we just made. She's around for a really long time right. and she has a lot of very human elements and she interacts with Nynaeve in this like very personal thing where like all kinds of fun, like, you know, enemies to lovers fanfic has been created about it. And like <laughs> it's a really cool relationship. And yeah, I think you're right. It enhances both of their standings as characters. Do you want to read the whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> it's not that long. And it's, like I said, I think it's a really, really awesome POV, not just as a Mogedian POV, but in terms of, like you said, getting information uh, about the cleansing. And just, it's it's some of RJ's good writing, where he's able to really pack incredible number of punches into very few words. Mogedian was not sure why she had remained this long. There could not be more than two hours of daylight left, and the forest was quiet. Except for the key, she could not feel Sidar being channeled anywhere. That was not to say that someone was not using small amounts somewhere, but nothing like the fury that had raged earlier. The battle was over, the other chosen dead or flying in defeat. Plainly defeat, since the key still blazed in her head. Amazing that the Chodan Kal had survived continuous use for this long, at this level. Lying on her belly atop her high vantage point with her chin in her hands, She was watching the Great Dome. Black no longer seemed to describe it. There was no term for it, now, but black was a pale color by comparison. It was half a ball now, rearing like a mountain two miles or more into the sky. A thick layer of shadow lay around it, as though it were sucking the last light out of the air. She could not understand why she was not afraid. That thing might grow until it enveloped the entire world, or perhaps shatter the world, as Arangar had said it might. But if that happened, there was no safe place, no shadows for the spider to hide in. Suddenly something writhed up from that dark, smooth surface, like a flame if flames were blacker than black, then another, another, until the dome boiled with Stygian fire. The roar of ten thousand thunders made her clap her hands over her ears and shriek, soundlessly in that crash, and the dome collapsed in on itself in the space of a heartbeat to a pinpoint, to nothing. It was wind that howled then, rushing toward the vanished dome, dragging her along the stony ground no matter how desperately she clawed for purchase, tumbling her against trees, lifting her into the air. Strangely, she still felt no fear. She thought if she survived this, she would never feel fear again. There is something about Stygian flames that always stuck in my head. Those... Sort of demonic. Actually, what is the definition of Stygian? Or Stygian? I have no idea, but it sounds demonic, and that's always been how I bend it. You know where I know that word from? Diablo 2. <laughs> <laughs> where is that word? Stygian fire. Well, it's a reference to the god Styx, probably. Oh. So the G is a little deceiving. It should be more like Styxian fire. Stygian fire makes more sense, I guess, but huh. Stygian relating to the river Styx or dark black, pitch black. So it's more of a dark, dingy flame. Okay. Right. Well, of course it's a dark flame, right? It's pitch black. That makes sense, right? So it's it's like fire, except that fire gives off light and this very much does not. Right. Sort of a black on black, ultraviolet type fire. Yeah, totally. For those of you who are reading the Cosmere anti-void light, if you uh, (laughs) catch that reference. 
I love how it echoes the drilling of the bore. Mm, mm-hmm. There's this sphere and then it starts to shatter and fall apart. Like in this case, there's a sphere and it sort of boils away. It's different, but the same, you know? Again, I go to my black hole analogy. To me, it's a collapsing black hole, right? It's reached that point where the internal pressures aren't holding it up anymore. And that internal gravity, essentially the attraction between um, Shadow Logoth and the taint, I think, as they're canceling each other out. You sort of, I imagine that Stygian flames bursting out is sort of the last gasp of Shadow Logoth trying to escape. And then the taint just collapses down in on, on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then that because it's, you know, incinerating and voiding out all of Shadar Logoth. It's also voiding out all of the air and all of the earth and making that huge dome, which then creates a rather large void that is you know, that massive thunderclap that, you know, it shatters the air around her. And then she gets drug in because air is rushing right. to fill that massive space. So, like, she's lucky she doesn't get ripped right off the edge of a cliff and thrown out into a void and chucked into a newly formed lake. I mean, so I did a little bit of math and assuming a two mile radius, right? She says it's two miles in the air. I'm assuming now we do get contradictory information that it's a three mile diameter, which is a mile and a half radius. She says two miles or more. So I'm so well, they're saying say three. she's essentially saying four in radius or four, four in diameter, two in radius. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Gotcha. But everyone's estimating. So everyone's estimating it's three to four miles across or in height, assuming a perfect sphere, right? Right, because it's magic and math and existential things. So a precision sphere makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. So doing a volume calculation, that would contain about 139 trillion liters of liquid, water, taint, whatever you want to call it, would fit. 139 trillion. It's a lot of taint. And then all that air gets sucked in, right? If that void disappears instantly, that volume's just not there. It, it's it's a lot of volume. Like, there's nothing in trillions I can wrap my head around, you know? That's so much volume. It's about 35 cubic miles is another way of thinking about it. <laughs> uh, wait, how can it be 35 cubic miles if it's only... Four miles across. Uh, imagine four cubed gives you a rough estimate. I really hate geometry. <laughs> it's so fucking counterintuitive. Actually, yeah. It's just like I just had the hardest time with comprehending space and volume. It just refuses to be intuitive. The square cube law is insane. The fact that if you take a, a solid of any size and double its volume let's say you take a, a cube you double its volume its surface area goes up by oh i want to say 4x or it's I, I have to go back and remember exactly what it is but essentially what you're doing is you're you are squaring the surface area and cubing the volume so for any given size, you know, the surface area grows pretty fast, but the volume grows so much faster. So all of a sudden you look at the ratio between your volume and your surface area. You have just an incredible amount of volume inside what's a relatively minor surface area. And that's the whole problem with breathing, right? That's why insects don't get big anymore. You can only take in oxygen through surface area, but you have to supply oxygen to your entire body. And since bugs only take in oxygen through their skin, they're limited in size by the amount of oxygen in the air. So when there's more oxygen, they could get bigger because they could actually absorb it inside of them. And so, ah. yeah, square, square cube law. It's a whole, it affects everything. It's why um, if you drop a mouse off the Eif uh, Eiffel Tower, it would land on its feet just fine and elephants go splat. Right, right. Yeah, I've, I've learned this with squirrels. I've learned this about squirrels because, you know. They're not that much larger than my same basic rule, but plus they have the tail that helps them parachute just that little tiny skosh. But I, hmm. so much of our universe, there's, it's a reason why things are different at different scales yeah. in our world. It's the reason why bacteria behave differently than people behave differently than elephants and plant planets, right? 
Right. It's why the atom and the solar system are not scale models of each other, even though there's an intuitive pull to try to make that comparison because of some of the size differences as a layperson. It's no, no. <laughs> the rules are very different. The sun generates less heat per volume than the per than, a, than a person does? No. What? Uh-huh. What? Uh -huh. what? There's just so much volume. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people generate a lot of heat. Well, I mean, we, uh, yeah, but... <laughs> but, but <laughs> the, 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 it takes... There's so much volume inside the sun and so little surface area that the amount of heat per volume, it matters on the surface area. It, 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 the, the square cube law creates all sorts of weird, unintuitive physical phenomenon. So, I, hmm. can we go back to the book where I know what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> One thing Mogedian says is she's amazed that the Choden Call lasts for as long as they do with the volume they do. Clearly, the female half doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a flaw of weathering or whatever. It's just the sheer intensity for whatever reason the male one holds out that little extra bit but like they're both like red on all sensors like engineering lights are all flashing oh totally totally although i do find it interesting that the male used a lot more power than the female one and it survived whereas the female one fell apart maybe that's the weathering factor coming into play that the female one was exposed and the male one was buried you you think that that makes a difference in... Well, we floated it for like 20 minutes in our last episode about this, so I'm trying to like have some continuity. I just, I want there to be an explanation other than women are weaker, and so all of their toys are weaker too. Oh, I like Super Skylake saying it's because it was further away, and so the link, it had to provide, you know, imagine you've got transmission losses, right? You're going to have to provide more power. So what you're saying is that they didn't have the right grade of extension cord. Or they use too many extension cords. You use that thin wire extension <laughs> cord and you put a whole house worth of lights on the other end of it. You are going to draw way more power through that cord the longer it is, right? There's inherent resistance in the cord. The longer it is, the more power you got to draw. It's too thin. It's going to melt. It's going to melt. That's why you got to use, you know, thick copper wire or, you know, thick headed sheep herders. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the only thing that can take that power. Is the woolly hair helped him channel it? <laughs> it collects the static. Though Nynaeve is, of course, the one who's actually from around there. Nynaeve's the, right, the actual right. bullhead, technically. Well, what do you think the braid's for? Right, right. It's, right. Just, it's clearly for conductivity, right? Yeah, that, that is her, her grounding rod. <laughs> it's uh <-huh>. her braid. <laughs> Bra braided, wool-headed stubbornness, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed to solid core, we'll edit stubbornness. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> that, that's, that's a joke for the uh, electricians out there. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we've got we got the Forsaken flying in defeat, which is something that obviously they're working by themselves independently facing these big circles. None of them die, I don't think. Uh, well. <clears throat> well, except for the one that doesn't count. Obviously. The one who dies again. Literally in just the last POV that we recorded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of them uh, died. Right, yeah. I, I, I was going to be like, do you remember last episode? Because no. I'm pretty sure we talked about one of them dying. It was just all on my high horse about remembering to bring forward concepts from another episode. But um, yeah. You are just like Elsa. You just have, you're just like, oh, that stupid um, Ashima, and I'll just bail fire him out of my brain. What does he matter? Well, much like Elsa, Varen has compulsed me. So <laughs> <laughs> she compels you quite a bit. Yeah, she's a very compelling Extremely character. Extremely compelling all the time. <laughs> Extremely compelling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super going to be doing a Varen cosplay once the show has presented us with a Varen two cosplay. Like, yes. Well, you saw the. We've gotten a shot of her, right? But yes, I'm going to require more than a single shot of her taking her hood off in order to make a cosplay. Amateur. I don't do cosplay. I've never done a cosplay. I'm going to need like a season's worth of marinating. That's what amateur means. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm not getting paid to do it. Ergo, I am an amateur. <laughs> what do you think about Mogedian's sort of like 
fatalistic attitude here. I mean, she's done so much to survive and hide and not be on the edge of danger that when she is, she's sort of like, well, not even going to try and run because I'm screwed no matter what happens. I feel like it gets so out of character. It speaks to the depth of the situation, right? Because it is, I feel like it often is the character who's the most of like a survivor and like the cockroach of the cast, like you just can't kill them. Like it's often that person who like when things actually come down to it and you know you're going to die, they're the one that's calm. I feel like that happens in every like ensemble cast media I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Like that happens. And so the fact that we're having that here yeah, it just kind of helps cue you into how terrifying this is to an Age of Legends channeler to witness from the outside. Oh, I liked what Shave Knees is saying, a sunk cost mentality. <laughs> She's like, well, I've already... I kind of agree, because it's like the the whole, like, a coward dies a thousand deaths and a brave man only once or whatever. Like, she's died so many times in all of her terror, and she's gone through so much that she's like, well, here it is then. Like, I've already imagined this so many times, like, and I can't run from it because literally the whole world might blow up. So, like, I know what I'm doing. I'm just here now. Yeah, I think I, I, I kind of parallel it to Nynaeve when she's drowning. Exactly, exactly. Because again, the two of them are are parallel in so mm -hmm. many ways. And yet Nynaeve right. surrenders when she can't. Mogedian doesn't bother feeling fear when she can't do anything. If the fear can't motivate her to change the situation, why bother having fear? A oh, Super Skylake has an interesting comment. She was an insurance agent. She knows how to avoid taking risks. She knows there's nothing to be done. So yeah. Yeah. Ex yeah. I think it all comes together. I think we're all in agreement. Moggy is an insurance adjuster. It's just like <laughs> pure evil already. I mean, I... Yes. <laughs> 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 Anything else to say about that little the second to last chunk or second to last POV, I suppose? No, no, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, it's it's late in the day. We're about to wrap up. The, ch the cleansing's not over yet, technically, but like it's about to be, you know, as it collapses, that's. I mean, that's, that's it, it there, right? So like, there it is. It's yeah. finally over. Um, so, yeah, we actually have. I said I said in the last episode that we only have two POVs left. With the omnipresent one counting, I was wrong. Um, we have two actual POVs. There's still some Cad Swain. And then we'll have the Omni one. I mean, the Omni one is literally a two, two short sentences. Yes, we'll, we'll bundle that with Cad Swain. So we've only got two more episodes with that, I'm guessing. Well, one more. Because Cad Swain's right. the next one. Yeah. So if we do Cad Swain and the Omni, next, next episode's the wrapping up of the cleansing. And Winner's Heart. Yeah, I think that that's probably what we're going to do. But yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Our TED Talk. Thank you Yes, that, that was definitely our TED Talk because I was the fool getting schooled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just the, I love the, the, when I learned about the, um, the square cube rule, which is just, it's just a, a physical reality, right? Of living in the 3D world. But it affects so much of math and science and physics and sort of gave me an intuition about big versus small for the first time and why big things are different than small things. Well, thank you for breaking my brain. It is one of my favorite things to have my brain broken. I love it. I love it's, breaking it's most brains. most excellent. Yeah, I love it. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of my favorite things to, to really get into. I, I really look for, for esoteric YouTube videos that can break my brain with but still stay within my level of understanding. Mm -hmm. I recently found a guy who does uh, quantum quantum mechanics stuff uh, that's very, and other physics things. He just does physics. It's very, very easy for me to follow. And it's just so good because he is talking about some really deep shit, <laughs> but he makes it mm. really accessible. And uh, I mean, it's why part of a huge part of why I stuck with geology for so long is because it's really easy to blow people's brains when you know geology. Mm-hmm. People have these really simple questions and you give them basic 101 level answers and their eyes are just like huge jaw Whoa. on the floor. And I'm like, you want me to tell you what I learned in my second term of classes? <laughs> like, you know, it's really, it's a really, really, really fun thing to be able to give and receive that sort of knowledge. Anyway, um, surprises. You want to shift over to some surprises? <laughs> hmm. 
I didn't open the wrong chapter or anything. <laughs> Shall we talk about surprises? Chapter 19, the Flame of Tarvalon. It's a name salad. Half the ice to die in the freaking camp. Half of them. Literally, it's so many names. I didn't even bother looking them up. There was so many names. I'm like, well, Mori is the bad one and nobody else ever matters again. So it's fine. That's, you know, they, there's the, like I said, the Shurium 6, or Shurium 5, you know, if you want don't want to include Shurium in them. There's Romanda's group. There's Lane's group. And then there's some independents and a few dark friends. But yeah, not going to go into the individual names here for the most part. Unless they do something meaningful. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I have a lot to say about this chapter. We'll we'll see what the final runtime is, but I don't think I've got a lot. It's it's a flame of Tarvalin, it's a name salad of eyes to die, it's Robert Jordan indulging in his noted love of names and knowing he has backstories in filing cabinets, even if he doesn't share them. Should I read us in? Yeah. Just the first paragraph though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By custom, the Amarlin was informed of the hall sitting, yet nothing said they had to wait for her before starting the session, which meant that time might be short. Egwene wanted to leap to her feet and march, and march straight to the big pavilion before Moria and the other two could spring whatever surprise they intended. Surprises in the hall were seldom good. Surprises you learned about late were worse. Still, protocols that were law, not custom, had to be followed for the Amarlin entering the hall. So she remained where she was and sent Swan to fetch Shiriam so she could be so she could be announced properly by the keeper of the chronicles. Swan had told her that was really a matter of warning the sitters of her presence. There were always matters they might want to discuss without the Amarlin knowing, and she had not sounded entirely as if she were making a joke. No, she's, there's no joking there. Um the only thing I say I will say is she does want to change this. She does change the fact that, you know, the Amerlin is by custom notified, right? To, by law, the Amerlin must be notified and be there before they can start a meeting. That's one of the things that Gwen talks about changing towards the end is like, stop it with these secret meetings. Stop it with this like gamesmanship around like whether or not we're going to be there for the meeting. Let's just all meet out in public where everyone can talk and stop doing the secret stuff. No, I thought that that was about informing all of the sitters in the hall. I didn't think that that was about the Amarlin. It includes the Amarlin in that, yes. Yeah. Oh, all right, cool, awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't like the Kyrian and levels of petty one-upsmanship that, like, the magic users think is acceptable for politics. Mm hmm I want to, the next thing I really want to bring up is this, they start talking about Moria. There's a lot of talk of Moria. Jordan was definitely Moria. dropping cookie crumbs, saying, if she was Black Oz, right. that sure would be explain a lot, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? <laughs> right. So Moria's black, right? You know, she used the one. She lays every sister who died after Suan was deposed at Elida's feet, right? She's trying to keep the tower broken up. She's trying to keep them apart. But she's also the one who then brings up the alliance with the Black Tower later. Yeah, she's there to make chaos. She's there to keep the tower divided. She's there to weaken the Aes Sedai. And, and that's, that's something I actually wanted to ask you about, because I feel like we get a contradiction here, right? We've got Shiriam and I think Delana, who are not happy with the decision to unite with the Black Tower, and they're black, and yet you've got this Moria, who the, whose control is she under? What, why is she suggesting that they unite with the Black Tower? Like, I, I don't understand why the black appears to want two different things at the same time. I'm assuming that they've got conflicting fl plots, right? Because that's one of their oaths is that they will, they can't betray very specific people set above them, but they can betray anyone else and do whatever else they want. And we know that the Forsaken often have contradicting plans. So I'm assuming that the Black Aja is not being driven in a unified way. I don't know who Moria is responding to. I don't know if we ever have any clues to that at all. But I would assume it's not the same hand that's driving Shiriam and Delana, which is interesting because it speaks to layers of Black Aja stuff happening that we we never learn about one way or another. And maybe also the whole, like, using the Black Tower thing is not a thing that all Black Aja want to do. 
Maybe, yeah. I mean, if that makes sense, but <sighs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've never... I think that's part of why it's hard to tell who's a dark friend is because they don't all have the same goals. And I just think that Jordan was making sure to keep us confused. I don't think there's evidence to ever prove why. I think it's just chaos. And I agree with Zul that Moria definitely always makes me think of the minds of Moria from Tolkien. Oh, like, yeah, obviously. absolutely. I feel, I feel like that has, has to be a to reference. Be. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, there's no real evidence that she's black until she just is on the list. Yeah, I feel like in hindsight, you can say, oh, that explains why she was sort of a pain in the ass. But like lots of people are a pain in the ass without being dark friends. So right. like, there's nothing that's right. clearly dark friendly. Whereas I feel like Delana and Shiriam, we end up seeing things that are like, oh, that was definitely dark friend stuff. We don't right, get right. that with Moria unless there's some stuff she does in New Spring. I feel like maybe she does some shady shit in New Spring. Maybe. I might be making that up. No, I don't see her in New Spring at all. Oh, okay. I'm making that up. I'm, I'm confusing her with someone else. Yep. Uh, and she do be in Ilianer, so very distinct. But yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about what she might be here to propose and given that she's a dark friend and none of these women know that she's a dark friend, none of that speculation seems particularly relevant. Though I do like the arrogance of them being like, well, clearly the shadow's aiming at Tar Valen. Like, obviously, if the one the the last battle's going to happen here and the weapons are going to get aimed here, and it, it reminds me of Egwene being like, well, if the, if the White Tower dies, then Hope dies. And I'm it just like... no. It makes sense for them to think that, but it's also hilarious that they assume that, like, well, if the one, if the last battle's going to happen, clearly Tarvalin is a place that needs to be protected. Like, does it though? You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of the coworker who won't go on vacation because if they're gone for a week, this place is just going to fall apart. You know, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, no, no, Karen, we're fine without you most of the time. As a matter of fact, if you went away, things might actually get a lot better. Because we all have to work around your ridiculous, you know, arrogance and plots to overthrow kings. Um, and if you just, you know, broke up and were more busy with your breakup rather than messing with office politics, um, uh, things would, would be easier for us. So, please, go on vacation. Please. <laughs> yeah, just like that. You know, they pretty much assume it's forsaken. The only thing I really have to say about that is... My rel has a warder in the dead center of the power and never says, oh, I mean, I know she's trying to cover a plan, right? But you think at least Egwene, she'd at least bring it up to Egwene and be like, yeah, so Lan was in the dead center of what I think was that power the whole time. It's very, very weird that she doesn't let Egwene know, like, you can't tell anyone, you have to act freaked out, but like, know that you don't need to freak out. Like, it would have been so helpful, but. And I have to wonder if that's just not an oversight. Of Jordan at this point that he just thinks of Lan and Nynaeve as being bonded and he just didn't kind of forgot that Myrell was bonded to Lan. I didn't think of it as a plot hole until we were podcasting through it. So I definitely could see RJ having just completely missed it because like I exactly like well, he's with Nynaeve now. Like, duh. Right. Duh. But he hasn't written that scene yeah, yet. Exactly. So it's um yeah, I I kind of feel like it's just an RJ oversight and we're going to just have to deal with that. An eye of the world. Yeah, isn't. <laughs> we're in book 10, which is kind of like book one. If you just turn the numbers around. <laughs> <laughs> it's a palindrome of exactly, uh, book one. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of talk in here about Egwene's headache and how much it's making it hard for her to think and hard to function. And she wants to snap at people and she can't read papers. And I mean, She's really powering through a blistering migraine at this point. Halima is really cranking that wave. And I'm wondering if it's maybe just to make her everything she does, like to make her snappish, to make her angry, right? I assume so. It's working really right. well. And that's why she has this reputation for being angry and snappish is because she's in pain all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Some more names. Niso and uh, Carolinia are waiting in front of the pavilion. Bayonin comes running up with her breath misting. Don't know why she's running. Remember, Bayonin's the anti-ferret. And sh there's no sign of Shiriam. Like, they made a, make a point that Shiriam's late, Shiriam's late, Shiriam's late. Shiriam shows up running and out of breath. 
And then Delana is also the last person to show up to the meeting. So I have to wonder if Lima wasn't perhaps lecturing both of them and let Shiriam go first. That was my assumption is that they're both being held by Halima to receive instructions or something. And I'm wondering what that was about. Like, cause I was just saying that Moria clearly isn't reporting to Halima, but what if she is, or what if that information that Moria saw at Shadow Logoth has already been communicated to Halima somehow, and she's telling them what to do or telling them what to do in case, because she doesn't know that probably makes more sense that she's like plotting out a few eventualities real quick and being like, do this or this. Yeah. What I'm assuming is she just got a bunch of standing orders. And I would assume one of those is prevent an alliance with the black tower simply because of the way she reacts to the alliance with the black tower. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. She, she sees that happening and just is bursting out in tears. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So she shows up. I'm terribly sorry, mother. Um, she said breathlessly, channeling hurriedly to clean off the mud. She had splashed on herself and fell to the walkway. I heard the hall was sitting. I knew you would be looking for me, so I came as fast as I could. So Suan didn't find her. She was sent out to find her and didn't. And then later, she like, she's swaying on her feet. She looks like she's going to sick up. And Alana is against it, too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I would I agree. I think Halim is just kind of like letting reminding them of their standing orders or something. But then I gotta wonder, like, is it a plot to be like, okay, don't support this? Uh, yeah, I, I I would think Moria is getting her orders from somebody else. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But you know, when I look up Moria, I <sighs> not a lot there. <laughs> I love Moria Karen Tanis. Her Karen is in her last name. <laughs> she was, Jordan knew about the Karen thing before it became a thing. <laughs> she is the one who suggested stopping the soldier's pay. Mm-hmm, which is a terrible idea. Yeah. I really feel like she just does whatever she can to throw the most chaos. I feel like she is Lord of, let the Lord of Chaos rule incarnate. Yeah, and I feel like that's a really safe bet whenever we can't explain why Dark Friends would do something. It doesn't make sense. It's like, well, but they all got the Lord of Chaos memo. Every last one of them. So when in doubt, that's it's like Taviran, but for Dark Friend plotting. Right. <laughs> we don't know why this worked out, but we think it's because Dark Friends are creating chaos. Ta Dark Friendery. <laughs> <laughs> I did find it interesting that um, by tradition, the two oldest sitters could can't claim the places closest to the Emerlin seat for their ajas. So little is done by age, but occasionally things are done by age in the White Tower. And that includes these sitters. Just the first two get to choose basically right and left of the Emerlin seat. There's so many weird things in the hall that seem like they could be done by anybody that are determined by age. It's so weird. Right. There's some stuff here with the youngest. There's some stuff here with the oldest. But it seems like in the hall, or within the sitters, is the only place that age really matters in the White Tower. Yeah. Uh, they get into the fact that there's a bunch of young, two young sitters. We've talked about that a bunch. We talk about how Egwene keeps the red stripe in her stole. Right, because she wants to reunite the tower, not eliminate the red, red Aja. She thinks they're actually useful for dealing with the men who can channel later. There's an interesting line here about a, a thing from Swan that I think ties into our discussion about Bode last time. Okay. About how, like the how Egwene understands why she can't be friends with Bodewin and Bode doesn't understand. Swan said that as many Omerlins had failed by believing the sitters were fully her equals as by believing the difference was wider than really existed. Same thing with novices, same thing with Aes Sedai, same thing with sitters. The distance between them and the Omerlin has to be very specific mm -hmm. in order for the whole multi-level marketing scheme to work. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like uh, ceremony and, you know, separation and authority that happens because in, in a lot of ways, there aren't a lot of rules. It's like what the Amberlin says goes, but she needs to be supported by the people who, you know, she has to win, you know, because in Congress, they've got the budget, right? So a lot of what they can do, they can enforce through the budget. 
And I feel like the hall is similar in that, like, the Amerlin can command whatever she wants to do, but the hall has to allocate money, allocate workers, allocate the the staff that are going to do it. They create the committees. They create the subcommittees, you know, like the Amerlin seat can command something. It's not as clear as to where the budget is controlled. No, it's not. But I think she says the hall controls it yeah. at some point once. For the most part. Maybe. But I feel like she could make a declaration and say this money is going here and the hall would have to do that. Right. Like the Amberlynn is more powerful than a president. Yeah. And it's a lifetime appointment also. So. Yeah. <laughs> For us. <laughs> yeah. They don't run elections and you don't step down except in a body bag. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's a good. That is a good question. Has any Amerlin ever just stepped down? No, they have. There have. There's been a few like where they've gotten removed and then put into exile, and then smothered with a pillow or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Very Napoleon. Yes, yeah, for sure. I'm going to retire to an island in the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. There's a whole thing about like why did the Greens sit not next to the Amerlin? This is such a huge deal. Why? Yeah, the the Greens and the Browns, right? I think the Greens are really upset with Egwene right now, right? I forget. I, wasn't there a, 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 some drama in the previous chapter? Because she... I know they don't like her later when she picks the Red Keeper, but that's different. But I feel like there's some real, like, because they think Egwene should be theirs, when she doesn't treat them better than everybody else, they get upset with it. There's some... She mentions something ridiculous about the Greens being annoying, and it, it's... It's so off to the side. Yeah. She says something about, like, the group that I would be the most fond of because I feel like I should come from them, and yet they are the most difficult. I don't remember what chapter that's in, but there's there's this thing where she's like, I thought you would be my friends, and instead you were just a pain in my yeah. fucking ass. You know, because she, they are. They're just constantly a pain in her ass. Yeah, but we never get any pre-OVs from the green to explain why Egwene isn't being a good green so it's it's just nothing. It's just whatever. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's probably just them being petty and being like, well, we're not sitting next to you in the cafeteria. <laughs> and I think the Browns is because, like, Takima got uh, fooled at the war council vote. Not fooled, but the, the way Egwene manipulated the war vote. Because she was the one who was like, you fools, don't you know what you've done, right? She's the one who realized first. So maybe she's like, I'm standing as far away from this Egwene lady as I possibly can like it matters but okay right right and then we just get like paragraphs of fucking names uh oh, and then, so yeah bad. half the Aes Sedai yeah. in the camp are gonna be in the pavilion whoop de fucking do yeah at, at, this is literally the place where we get the line at this rate half the Aes Sedai in the camp would be crowded into the pavilion before too long yes Jordan you are listing off at least he's aware of it I guess yeah, a little self-awareness. Yeah. And, like, I realize that, like, our podcast, like, description is we help you get through this without needing to memorize all the eyes to die. Like, we do that for you. We're just letting you know none of these eyes to die matter. No. Literally. No. I mean, then they might matter in their own indiv- individual scenes, but just be aware there's a bunch of eyes to die in the camp here. It, they don't do anything important. They don't make any difference. They just they show up, they watch, they leave. There's some, maybe if you want to talk about the voting for the tower, we can get into it a little bit. But again, it, it's mostly just broad categories yeah. and mostly because of the black. Yeah. So so they get together. They start the session. They're like, oh, it doesn't need to be formal. Yeah, it does need to be formal. We need to be dramatic. I, I don't even know. We're kind of just recapping the fact that stuff has happened already. <laughs> Yeah. Lelaine and Ramonda get into this, you know, powerful uh, power struggle. You know, it seems talks with Elida have been licensed. I understand in the law, under the law of war, we don't need to be consulted with this, but I believe we should discuss it. Right. Like that sort of level of like, OK, uh, we've all been in those board meetings where someone got cut out of a decision and they really didn't want to be. So they're going to make a big stink about it. Right. This is Romaine. It's what they're doing. They don't like being cut out of power decisions. Right. Right. So we don't need to really get into that. What we do want to get into is when we finally get the report about the site of the cleansing, right? This is the part of the meeting that's actually interesting. 
Yeah. The hall did be called by three sisters asking the same question. That question must be addressed before any other. What did Arkin and her party find? What we saw was a roughly circular hole in the ground. It may have been a precise circle originally, but ha the sides have collapsed in some places. The hole is approximately three miles across and perhaps a mile and a half deep. The bottom is covered with water and ice. We believe it may become a lake eventually. That's that's the fun part. That is the fun part. Yeah, no more Shadow Logoth, just a big lake, which... If you go back in the show, actually, makes it makes a lot of sense because it's already in the middle of a lake. So if you scooped out the city, of course, the lake would fill it in. Yeah, totally, totally. It'll just be a smooth lake. And yeah, I totally agree with Shave Knees in chat. I I was totally envisioning this as like a Randland Crater Lake. For all of you who know Oregon uh, geology, we've got this amazing volcano caldera that's full of uh, just the coldest, clearest blue water. Uh, it's got a little island in the middle called Wizard Island, um, but it's just so striking. And did you know that island has a lake on it? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. <laughs> There's a lake on an island in the middle of the lake. In a volcano. Yeah. In a volcano. Yeah. Mount yeah. Mazama it blew its top about 7,000 years ago. Indigenous stories absolutely tell us that that happened. You can find ash from that eruption all across the Pacific Northwest, all over the place. You can find the Mazama ash layer and it will like tell you precisely where you are in geologic time, the recent geologic time. And yeah, I, I would imagine that Shadar Logoth has a similarly striking, like who scooped an ice cream scoop into the ground. But I, I don't think you're going to have that little Island in the middle, right? You, no, that, you know. no. I don't think there's a wizard Island in this scenario. <laughs> Which I think is the thing that really makes Crater Lake cool. Well, I mean, what makes it cool is the fact that it's cold as but yes, it's cold. It's perfectly circular and it's yeah. deep as hell. And the deep is what yeah, makes it and cold. It's beautiful. It's super clear because it's like snow and rainwater. Um, just stupid clear. Well, because it doesn't get fed by a spring or anything. It's no, just it's still snowy. water. It's super, super snowy there. My my grandmother worked as a park ranger in Crater Lake National Park for several years. Um, and I got to see Crater Lake like in the winter when the snow is just all massive. there. It's just it's so pretty. It's I've so never pretty. been. <gasps> it's uh, it's, far, it's far south. It's real far south, but it's spectacular. It's, it's on the to-do list, but it's, you know, it's one of those things that if you live in Paris, you never go to the Eiffel Tower, right? Like, yeah, it's it's always something you put off and do later. Yeah. Well, I haven't been since I was a little kid. So maybe maybe uh, us and our respective partners should make a road trip out of it and go see it during the off season because fuck tourists but it is or one of Oregon's most famous uh natural beauties but unlike uh you know shadow logoth shadow logoth is in a plane right it's just like a normal city like crater lake is in a in a volcano it's a former volcano okay so if you scooped a chunk out of the ground that was two miles deep what are you hitting is there just are, is bed is are you just hitting bedrock at two miles deep that's not like oh yeah yeah okay yeah you're just you're just scratching the surface i mean there's mines that go down that deep grand canyon is like a mile or two deep something like that what's the deepest we've dug do you know that nine miles i want to say is the nine deepest miles? borehole where we can't get the drill bit to stop melting at that point because then it's just really, we're basically close enough to lava that it's just hot, right? Well, I mean, it gets hot as you go down um, pretty quickly. Um, even human dug mines, like just ancient mines, can get quite toasty as you go down. But yeah, like we, we aren't, it, it, our deepest hole is not anywhere near the actual magma layer. It's just really hot rock. So Kola Super Deep Borehole uh, is a R Russian project. Yeah. They got 7.6 miles or 12,200 meters into yeah, the ground. Yeah, I was overestimating. Yeah. And like, it's it's just, it's such a pinprick. So yeah, two, three miles down, like the rocks are barely warm. It's fine. Not going to get a volcanic eruption from that. No more, no more uh, soil though for farming. No, for sure. no. You are down into some bedrock for sure. There is not a lot of places in the world where the sediment layer is that deep. <laughs> But I really, I love that this sort of is the turning of the wheel and the elimination of the evil, the Shadow Logoth, right? Like, the only thing that's left now is Fane and the Dagger. Mm-hmm. 
rootless, planktonic, right. looking for a place to settle down. And I, I love, too, how the eyes to die are like, oh, it's so good to get rid of this, you know, cesspool of the shadow. And it's like, it wasn't the shadow, though. That's the whole point. If it was the shadow, right. then getting rid of it with the taint wouldn't have worked. It, it, it was a different kind of evil than the shadow. Right. Yeah. And which is as much an antithesis to the shadow as it is to good people. Exactly. Right. Shadow Logoth hates the shadow. Precisely. And obviously they don't know that the taint just got run through Shadow Logoth and that's why it vanished. I mean, that they don't know that. Though they do know that far more of Saiyadeen was used than of Saiyadar. That was interesting to me. Yeah, from the resonances. Yeah, which again really begs the question of why the female Chodan call broke and the male one didn't. Because the male one apparently was used way harder and Mogedian was surprised that the female one was putting up with the use it was being put to. Like, the male one should have given out then, right? The the only thing I can say is that it's got a greater factor of safety built into it, that they know men tend to channel more power and they, you know, the engineers who built it said, well, let's make this one a little more robust because we know Sidene tends to get used with more frequency and power. I don't know. Or I, I do like the idea that it sat out and, and it weathered, right? That like the female one was exposed to the elements and the male one was buried and covered and protected and somehow that had something to do with it. You could talk about the relative differences in strength between Nynaeve and Rand, and that perhaps his inherent larger strength meant he had to pull, you know, only a hundred times his strength out of the Choden Call, whereas Nynaeve had to pull 200 times her strength out of the Choden Call. I, it, it, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have no idea. I really don't know. Yeah, I'm not super happy with it. I think it's just for plot sure. reasons that he wanted Rand to still have the Choden Call, but he didn't want the female one to be around anymore. So, you know, why not break one and not the other? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that the only good explanation is plot reasons. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in world, it could be anything from a, a slight manufacturing defect that caught the, in the female one that maybe gave out a little bit earlier to just uh, the weathering, the exposure... But yeah, they, they are reading the residues of the the nearest approximation to all the Sidene got used. Just all the Sidene got moved through this space. All of it. Literally the entire infinity of Sidene has moved through this space. That's what they're sensing. I uh, see, I would I would actually disagree with that because my understanding is still only a portion of Sidene moved through, enough to get the siphoning effect on the taint. But it wasn't all of Sidene, because all of Sidene is an infinite amount, right? This is this is something we have a quote of Jordan about, from Jordan about, where he's like, no, he couldn't channel all of Sidene, because that's a river that never ends. Okay, so he was able to channel it enough that, that the, the taint came out. The taint itself was pulled off. And this brings me back to the square cube law. Oh, right? no, no. Yeah. Right, I'm buckling in. I'm buckling in. <laughs> All right. The river that is Sidene is a three-dimensional object. Lots of volume. The taint is a two-dimensional object that sits on the surface. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, like having different sizes of infinities, right, the taint is actually can cover an infinite amount of of Sidene, even though it is a finite amount of taint. Okay. And I'm sort of, I'm conflating two things going on here, but mathematically stuff like that is possible. But then you run out, like, it, one molecule thick, right? You, you, like, how, how thick is the, how can you have it be infinitively? All right. So if you, if you want to get into the mathematics of it, there's something called Gabriel's horn. The true horn of Valir, if we'll talk oh, okay. about this. Okay. This, this is a mathematical construct that looks like a horn, right? It's got an open shape, and then it sort of narrows at the bottom. Now, that narrowing is getting closer and closer and closer and closer, and it never quite touches, right? That's asymptotic. Okay. The interesting thing is you can represent the volume of the horn as a finite number, right? So, if you wanted to fill the horn with paint, liquid paint, you could do that. Because there's a finite volume to it. The surface area is infinite. So if you wanted to paint Gabriel's horn, the inside of it, you could never have enough. 
and it breaks all of your intuition of how could something have an infinite surface area but not have an infinite volume. That doesn't seem allowable. <laughs> and and that is the math of infinite sequences and in series. And it's one of the things that, like, it is really messed up. But... Uh... <laughs> it, and it, again, it, this this is obviously an object could, that could never exist, right? Because what you're essentially saying is that tip of the horn that goes on forever, right? You're always creating more surface area, but essentially the volume tapers out to nothing. Right, right. I mean, yeah, obviously it couldn't exist in the real world. And that's part of why it's intuitively difficult is because, well, yes, it, it, it can't exist except in math. In math. And then in math, you have this, this shape that 100% has an infinite surface area and a finite volume because of the way that the the two versus three dimension like reality is yeah and that's and that's where i come back to the cleansing and the taint and the relationship between you know you can have an infinite volume right which you do with sidene and sidar but a finite surface area i'm sort of invert gabriel's horn is the okay. inverse of yeah, that yeah, yeah. but essentially you know, if you go the other way, you can contain an infinite volume in a finite surface area. And so you can have a finite amount of taint that you can pull off an infinite Sidene or Sidar. Right. It's still more Sidene than anyone's ever wielded before. It's still yes. like the largest yes. amount of residues they'll ever find ever. But I see what you're saying that he didn't, he couldn't do an infinity of Sidene because infinity is what it is. Right. Yeah. No, okay, that that makes sense. That makes sense. And so that's I, I think a lot of people get very confused about that concept when you're talking about um, the cleansing because you have these what seems like an infinite amount of sidine and you're like, how does he do it all? Right? How does he cleanse all of it? And you have to really imagine this weird mathematical construct that makes me go, okay, Jordan, you're just such a fucking physicist, Nerd. right? Like this is such a like edge case weird physics thing. And you know, you know, he had the mathematics of this stuff in his head. It's too mathematically consistent, even though it's magic. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. There's the, it's the math of black holes, infinities, infinite sums, square cube law. Like, this is all like really, I don't want to say basic physics, but it's stuff that you have to learn in physics to wrap your brain around some of the sort of physical phenomenon and the mathematical phenomenon that you encounter in like calculus. If you really want to understand calculus, you have to kind of understand this kind of stuff, you know, and like, I think it's obvious that Jordan did. And I think it's obvious that he was using it in his magic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I love him so much. It's so cool. And, and what's so fun is just the, the way that like when I read these books as a kid, I later discovered gods like Thor, who somehow was related to Randall Thor, right? Clearly, he was using these literary references. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. He's using all these literary references in his books. And then later, when I learned all the math, I was like, oh, he's using all these singularities <laughs> and math concepts in his books, too. And, and yeah, it's a very similar yeah. experience to have read about it beforehand and then learn the source at an older age because I was reading these books at such a young age. Yeah, definitely. I mean, same with the world history stuff. Like, you learn world history, and you're, like, able to fit it totally. into the framework of this is where Jordan got the inspiration from, and it makes the real world make more sense because you have this, like, decryption key of Robert Jordan being such yes. a well-read polymath of quilting together references. It's very cool. It, it, it's where I think the origins of Wheel of Time yeah. really shines by Michael definitely. Livingston. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to see a math mathematician do this, a similar sort of thing. Mm. That would be cool. The mathematics of the origins of the Wheel of Time. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of this stuff, I, I will say, you know, I'm like, oh, this is the key to understanding math. And like, I didn't got, I wasn't taught a lot of this stuff in high school and college. A lot of it comes from watching YouTube videos of people be like, so you know that concept you learn in college? Here's a more intuitive way to understand it. Yeah, YouTube adversity is good for so many different subjects. <laughs> Yeah, but I will say having a baseline education of stuff you know is true helps you root out the bullshit 
in the YouTube universe because there is a lot of bullshit, yes. right? Because there's no requirement to get online and talk bullshit into a microphone. Trust me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, knowing how to parse the good stuff out is is a critical thing. But once you have that baseline, man, there's some good stuff out there. So they get through all this talking about the aftermath of the cleansing, well, not the cleansing, the removal of Shadar Logoth and sort of the implications about that. And then they get to the real crux of the matter, which is, does this change anything? Yeah. My question is this. Has this changed anything for us? It should, Moria said. It, it won't. It doesn't. It doesn't. That's part of the reason why we're having trouble coming up with anything to say about this chapter is like they just go, oh, yeah, that happened. They run in circles to no end about this. This has no bearing on them other than in the fourth age, you're going to really need to go on a big PR campaign to bring the good news of the cleansing to everybody. Because, like, that's a thing that you aren't believing right now. But, like, it's just none of the rest of it matters. The one thing she does do is she turns it into the the push to create an alliance with the Black Tower. She basically says... There's so much power being used there. You know, we're maxed out at circles of 13. Even our strongest 13 could come nowhere close to that amount of power. We need to make bigger circles. The only way to do that is to include men. We need to go to the Black Tower and make an alliance. That's her argument. It's just not bad reasoning. It's coming from a bad person for bad reasons. But, like, you can see why smart, good people go along with it. Because, like, that is a reasonable argument. It's dead wrong. There's nothing that they could possibly do mm -hmm. to fight something like that, no matter how big their circles are. It's not a forsaken weapon. The men aren't going to be interested in dealing with your condescending bullshit. But, you know, on the face of it, it makes sense. Yeah. And, and it's a good step towards creating big circles for the last battle. I can see why Jordan wanted yes. this to happen and was pushing his characters to Definitely. do it. You want those multi-mix circles in the last battle, of course. I, I'm surprised nobody else is making that argument, but yeah, essentially that's why why they want to do it. Why is Moria pushing this? I have no clue. Why is a dark friend trying to push something that's going to help the light? I, it is a good idea. I don't. I'm like, other than pissing off the people in the White Tower and creating further political division. It's all about the scale she's operating at, right? Is she thinking about last battle or is she thinking about the siege? Is she thinking about keeping her dark friend cover as the blues make a plot that she can't get out of? Like, what scale is she operating at? Who is she answering to? How much free agency does she have? How much is she operating as a black versus a blue? Like, we just never get any information to figure it out. I agree. It's very perplexing that this move that's good ultimately is being approved by a dark friend. But like... Dark friends can do good shit for good or bad reasons, given that they're playing 4D chess with their subterfuge. I love that Magla is like, only a dark friend could suggest this. And he does say Moria paled at the accusation and then went bright red of anger at her own. Because it's right. Right. Because she has to go through that. Like, does she know? No, she's no. just being an asshole. Right. And I can keep my cover by just blowing up the correct way. Right. You know, there's the typical, they're they're channeling Tainted Sidene, they're going insane, it's a terrible idea, that's what caused the breaking of the world, you know, the the women of the Aes Sedai didn't try to work with them, it's all, all the reasons why it's a bad idea to work with men who are slowly going insane. I just love the irony of them coming back from witnessing the event that would make that whole argument irrelevant. It is really deliciously ironic that the main reason why men are scary is also negated by the event that's freaking them out so bad. Which is the event that's then spurring you to go seek out the men as allies, despite the fact you think they're going insane. It's a fun little... And, and honestly, I think the whole reason Jordan wrote this chapter is the rumors sped the myth... People get things wrong and they act on it in a fog of war and that creates weird, strange bedfellows and it's all based on misinformation and misinterpretation of rumors and facts. And, and I think that like the deliciousness and the irony of them making an alliance 
with the Black Tower, despite the fact the men are going insane, when they, they actually have it all wrong, when they should be making that alliance because the men aren't going insane because of the event, but the event should still cause the alliance. I just, uh, I love, I love the irony there. I love how um, he wrote that. And I just wish the politics around it were less painful to read. I'm nodding. Again, the assumption that it's the Forsaken. Okay, does Egwene have any clue what happened? Has anyone gone to her and been like, because we know Elaine is like, oh yeah, Rand was totally at the center of that. I don't think she ever gets any information about that until weeks after the fact. I don't know when she gets it. I feel like she gets clued in at some point, but it's like weeks after the fact. I don't think anyone has any clues around this point in time. Well, I, th- I think she gets kidnapped before she gets any sort of intelligence reports, right? right? So, right. And, and then nobody in the tower is communicating. So it would have to be in her dreams talking to Elaine, which I think does happen at one point. Yeah, I think it happens like maybe after she's got the seat, after Elaine's queen, somewhere in there she gets the update. Yeah. And then I think she doesn't she pass that information back to Suan and back to the camp and everything like that. But at that point, it doesn't matter. I think so. Yeah, I think it does. It does percolate out through osmosis at some point, but it's so much later than this. Again, there was silence, but for Shiriam's sniveling, don't know why Shiriam's having a fucking meltdown about this other than it's against her standing orders. Yeah, I'm sure that Halima is super not down with this and has made it clear to Shirion that she will be soundly and sadistically tortured if certain things don't go the way she wants. And she's a physical coward, so she's, like, crying about it. Delina's face had turned decidedly greenish. She looked as if she might be the one to sick up rather than Shirion, right? So these two were under the thumb of the same person. Who's really mean and petty. And they're obviously not supposed to let this go forward. And they have no ability to stop it, and they both None. know they're going to get beat up about it. Yeah. You know, I don't know what to say other than, like, why are they so against something that another dark friend is bringing up? And it's just, I think, the left hand not talking to the right. Get it? Osengar and Arangar. (laughs) They might not even know that Moria is a dark friend. The way that the hearts work, like, Moria doesn't know that they're dark friends, and they don't know that Moria is a dark friend. So, like, they can't be coordinating. Because the only one who knows who all the dark friends are is Alviaren. And Varen. Well... (laughs) But yes, but most of the people don't know that Alviaren is the head of the Black Aja. She knows that they're all dark friends, but they don't know she is. So yeah, despite the fact that they go through a big, long scare session about the Ashaban, they end up voting overwhelmingly in favor. Right. Well, I wouldn't say overwhelmingly. I think it's a very close vote. It, it's quick. It's a decisive. It's okay. It's not overwhelming, but it is decisive. Yes. The people who are going to vote yes, no, and don't bother beating around the bush about it. Because until, I think, Lelaine stands up, right, it's still not passed. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's swift, but not overwhelming. And, um, and yeah, surprising. There's a few people who make some surprising choices, and everyone's like, wow, that was intense. And then that's going to happen. They're sending a bunch of women to go get turned and killed. And uh, do any of them survive to make it to the last battle pavara any of the people they send no pavara comes from the tower I don't oh think that's any right of this embassy makes it maybe they do i don't know i don't remember who they send well when they send that embassy out we will uh check and see if any of them survive but i think only pavara of all the eyes that that go to the black tower survive to make it to the last battle i thought there was a few other that's others that were part of the rebel group that were bonded to like Narishma and but not Narishma's not at the Black Tower though. Narishma's not one of the ones that right. bonded an Aes Sedai at the Black Tower. Like of all the Aes Sedai who get sent there to do various shenanigans, I don't know any other names off the top of my head that survive outside of Pavara. There might be a few though, because I'm fuzzy on those plots. So, and Super Sky like saying they never even get in far enough to get turned. That I would believe. Yeah, I am I forget the ins- There's so many different embassies that show up at the Black Tower gates being like, we want bonding. It's it's a little confusing. Yeah, I, I used to know, but I've lo- I forget at this moment. Yeah, but nonetheless, all of those women are getting sent definitely out of the frying pan into the fire by leaving the siege and going to the Black Tower. But yeah, they all vote in favor of it. And 
Egwene asks if there's anyone who feels she needs to resign her chair over it because that matters, I guess. Like, oh, I can't be in a body that would vote this way. It's so morally repugnant. Nobody does that. And then she says, we're going forward. I don't have anything else marked to talk about. Yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, the bonding. Yeah, I don't... Um, I want to look, look that up, but I don't have anything else. Yeah, just read us out, I think. Then we will go forward, she said carefully. It will take time to plan exactly who is to approach the Black Tower, and what they are to say. Time for her to plant a few safeguards, it was to be hoped. Light, she was going to have to scramble to deal with this. First, are there any suggestions for our embassy? Basically, so there's the embassy that was sent out to talk to Rand and Kyrian, and they ended up, right, those are the rebels that are bonded to Rand, because they found, but that happened ages ago. That's a different yeah, embassy. Yeah, no, this is where, my question was entirely about the ones who go to the Black Tower, either to gentle them or to deliberately bond with them. The, yeah, the, um, Logan evacuated the Black Tower including all the bonded Aes Sedai, and that's before the Saladar Embassy or the Red Aja Embassy arrives. So then what happens to those two embassies? Although it is not possible to determine with certainty which embassy arrived first, evidence during the Knife of Dreams epilogue given by Atel Marasha before he's interrupted by Taim seems to indicate that not only did the Saladar Embassy get there before the Red Aja did, but they bonded Ashaman already. Yeah, I remember that when the Red Embassy shows up. They're, like, the third to arrive. The Saladar Aes Sedai Embassy consists of Lyrell, Janya, Norisa, Maland, Adolin, Myrell, Nisau, Phelan, and Theodrin. Oh, a bunch of those survived to make it to the last battle. Okay, so cool. They're not all getting sent to their deaths. That's nice. Yeah, I, th I do remember there is, like, in the last battle, there's a whole bunch of them that are just bonded to Ashman. And I think that that just sort of happens off screen. Let me look up some of the, some of the, a lot of them are here present in this moment, right? Because they're the ones who get sent off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Melinda is a big part of this. Melinda and Moria really like tag team, uh, making this whole meeting thing happen. There, Egwene does wonder if so. The um, the embassy to Black Tower is mostly made up of Egwene's supporters, and she wonders if maybe that's why they were sent mm. to get to undermine her support because it's like. Theodrin and Phelan are both her supporters, but they're not even full sisters. A bunch of the other ones already have orders, right? And right, aren't right. green. But yeah, the Tower Eyes to Die have a much worse rate where only Pravara survives of all the Tower Eyes to Die. But yeah, the Rebel Eyes to Die do all right. And the summary says, after the battle in the Black Tower, Nisau may or may not have bonded one or several of the promised 47 Ashaman. Uh-huh. And likely fought in the last battle. So, essentially, you got the battle battle in the last tower, and this group of Aes Sedai is forgotten. One assumes they bonded some. Some of them have bonded Ashman and were in the last battle, but it's all off screen. Mm. Cool. Wow. Phelan is part of the delegation sent to the Black Tower, where she chooses a soldier Ashman as warder under Lyrell's instruction. Some Aes Sedai bond too, but Lyrell told for Le Fail lane to only take one. Like the rest of the party from the Black Tower, can be assumed she fought in the last battle, though it's not specified alongside whom. Lacking any other information is presumed she survived. So yeah, just a lot. This delegation is not something that... So they're not doomed to die. They're just doomed to wander off the page and be presumed alive and having fought in the last battle with no glorious actual right. conclusion, despite the books upon books of buildup that they got. Yep. The the really only scene is that scene where they disguise themselves as dark friends and then lure people into the um 
and get yeah. the seals right and lure them into the the setting. That's sort of the one scene where we see some of the Ashaman and Aes Sedai bonded, and that includes some of these Aes Sedai who were sent to the Tower delegation or, or from the Saladar delegation. But that's the only evidence we have is that like that one scene, a couple of them are bonded. So the assumption is there was that big battle. Later, they show up and they say, hey, we're here to bond you for the last battle. They get bonded, they get recruited, and they go fight in the last battle. But definitely an off, off-screen off thing, which is it's just frustrating for all the buildup and stuff that happens here that we don't never get any resolution. Yeah. I would really like for someone like Faelane to have, you know, more plot time than presumed to survive. Right. Right. Because she was such a big part of Egwene's yeah. storyline. And Nynaeve's for a while. She was part of trying to break Nynaeve's plot. Yeah. I mean, it's just... No, that was Theodron. But both of them, the Theodron and Faelin, like, they're this pair that you expect to, like, see doing things repeatedly. And they just get left to wander off stage while, like... I mean, I love Pavara, but, like, why did Pavara get elevated when those two were right there, you know? Yeah, th- there's a lot of ca- characters that Jordan brings up that I'm like, oh, my God, why even bring this character up? We don't find out what happens to them. And I'm I'm sort of I'm like Jordan. Why introduce new characters at this point in your right. story? Right. And and I don't mind that Brandon didn't tell me what happened to every single random I said I that he brings up in these meetings. But some of the ones that are critical to our characters, it seems like he forgot about and didn't bother. Right. In favor of new, less interesting, less developed characters, often, which is like you've got a whole cast. They've got books of backstory. You don't need new ones. We have them at home. And I've said it a million times, but I really don't think Jordan knew what to do with Fane. I think Fane was a great element, and I would have loved to see more of him involved in the last battle and more of the sort of wild card being thrown in, uh, disrupting plans, sort of the Joker card in both people's plans. I really, really hope that that happens with the show. I really hope that Fane never dies and is still a problem when we get up to the end. I really want like him to just be the perpetual antagonist in a way that the books should have had him. Which, speaking of, it's one month until the show drops. Oh, yeah. Today's one, one month, month until the show comes yeah. out for us. Less yes, than that for yes, you listening to it. Less than that for you listening to it. But it is August 1st today, and that's mm-hmm. it's, it's August now. We have reached August. So I'm re- really trying not to hype myself up about the show this season. Um, Because I overhyped myself last season and paid the price, which is to say that it didn't meet my expectations. Whether or not those expectations were fair is a totally different discussion we can get into. Um, But this year I'm trying to like, I'm not watching the breakdowns of the trailers. I'm not watching all the little rumors about where people are filming and how people like, oh, like I've heard like, oh, Rans and Kyrie and I'm like, oh, okay, like. That's about as spoilery from the stuff as I've gotten. Other than our discussion, I know we just released a whole episode where we went deep into it. Um, But I'm trying not to. That was sort of my own mostly opinions. I'm trying to avoid other people's takes on on the show. Um, Just so I walk into it without any well, that was my approach last year and that's my approach this year i'm still very hyped i, d- I enjoyed drifting in and out of the dusty wheel live stream because i was still on that like WatCon like come down and it was like hanging sure, out with sure. the WatCon people like while the trailer experience was absorbing into my brain but i don't have the energy to get too deep into all the i, I want to just experience it on its own right um but that doesn't mean i'm not hyped as fuck i'm so hyped I'm so excited. <laughs> you, you are much more hyped than I am. Yeah, I'm you're just so like, cranky. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you're I'll watch so it. fucking cranky. I am. I am just. I am. I am <laughs> taking Jess's approach, which is to say, I am. I am a Labrador. I like to like things, and like that's just that's that's my approach. And you just get to deal with it. You crotchety old man. I'll always, always have the books. Have the books. And if yes. I have to do my own podcast episodes where i'm just purely hyped about it and you ha- have to have your own where you're just purely <laughs> crotchety about it then we can do that um we should do like uh 
Sidene and Sidar episodes, like the first half is pure praise and it's you, and the second half is pure criticism <laughs> and it's me. And all all I do is go in and pick it apart, and you go in there and say everything yeah. that was wonderful about I, it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I have an inner book cloak that I can unleash, but I just choose not to for the most part because I prefer being a Labrador in hype mode. I, I, and I think my, what I've come down to with the show is I like everything I've seen. I just haven't seen enough. The first season didn't give me nearly enough. It cut out way too much. It skipped over a lot of things that I wanted to see. Um, and I don't think that's being negative about it. I think that's just being like, oh, it's not, it's not enough for what I, for what they're doing. I want more. I want, you know, 20 episodes and one of those to be just Rand and Matt, you know, wandering from end to end getting in trouble you know let's do a beach episode or a high school episode or you know let's do some of these like mid-season doldrum episodes that don't lead anywhere or do anything that we all complained about when tv was like that you know we have so. all heard that from you so many times we know you're so many times the cloud. it will get off your lawn just as soon as we turn recording mm -hmm. off <laughs> i'm just gonna be hyped you just have to deal with it uh, good. I'm glad you are. I, I guess I'm trying to say is like I am hyped. I'm just trying not to um Okay. Do you remember the movie called Nine? It was uh, a Tim Burton movie. Um it was an adaptation of a short and I was I watched the short and I saw the movie was coming out. And this was a long time ago. Yeah, shaved knees nose. And I was so hyped. I thought this was going to be like one of the best movies of all time. I really loved it. And the movie was essentially a longer, worse version of the short, right? It was, it was a letdown. It wasn't very good. Um, instead of expanding the universe, they essentially just retold the same story as the short just over an hour and a half and there wasn't any more content. Um, and I think it was at that point that I realized that I can really ruin something by overhyping it before it comes out in my own head. Uh, and to really like stop doing that to things that I want to love because there's no way the reality will live up to the thing I wanted and created in my own head. You know, um, the second Stormlight Archive book, I did it too as well. I, oh, I love the first Stormlight Archive book so much. And I thought I knew where he was going with it. And then he went in a different direction for the second book than I thought. And so I hated it, even though it's still a great book, because it wasn't what I was expecting. And so I'm just really trying to avoid doing that with The Wheel of Time. I'm just expecting that I'll enjoy it. And that seems like a reasonably vague bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in we'll find out. And I, I don't even know if they're doing one, two, month. or three episodes for the premiere. I hope to God it's not three. Uh, I think it is three again. I'm not watching three in one day. It's just, just be. I, it, it, it was something about the release dates on, you know, one of those like IMDb where they like put the first three out at once or something like that. I saw. Well, I'm I'm not. Tr we are not going to try to cover them all at once. But, Fuck that. No, God, no. I think we're going to do... I don't even know if I want to try and cover them until they're all done. I mean, honestly, that would make so much more sense, would be to literally be on a rewatch of the season and then do our stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Especially because there's going to be such a glut of people responding instantly. Like, we can come plodding along in the aftermath. <laughs> yeah. Or do, like, one episode per week starting, you know... If, if they let's say they release the first three and then we record a week later, basically everyone's recording. We'll have four down. We're like, okay, we're talking about number one when number four is out, yeah. you know, and then one per yeah, we week or something like that. Seasons uh, out. Just do it completely after agreed. because then we can at yeah. least be spoilers for the season and know where episode one and eight. Connect. Yeah, it makes more it sense does. with our brand. It really does. Yeah. So, and then. We can just enjoy uh, the ride as consumers and not as content creators. Because that was mm -hmm. 
that was the thing that really I'm that's the thing I am changing about my experience this year is I'm not looking forward to it as a content creator I'm looking forward to it as as just an enjoyer of the thing and like the whole reality of being a content creator is completely off to the side whereas last time I was like excited <clears throat> to participate as a content creator and like that whole right, element of it right. ended up being really like not toxic but corrosive like just internally yes. it had nothing to do with the community the community was fine but like just that was too much to process the, i think I, I think we had the idea and and i certainly think it was it was not unjustified that the show would come out and there would be a large interest in content creators and that we would be dumb not to position ourselves to take advantage of a large new fan base for the show and we expected you know and, and there were conversations that i had where people were like we're gonna see 10 times the download numbers on all wheel of time podcasts that we've ever seen and the reality is that didn't happen as far as i'm aware with a few maybe notable exceptions right i mean dusty wheel clearly took advantage of it um but my understanding is pretty much no podcaster had their numbers budge. Well, Allie all. and Gus's show coverage episodes got hella traction, particularly their eight hour okay. final ep- season premiere or season mm-hmm. finale episode. Like that one has gotten a fuck ton of traction way outside of all their other stuff. Um, but they had really like industry specific takes and like they got passed right, around a right. lot because they had so much more to say than just their opinions. They were like, no, pr- as professionals, we have actual takes. Um, but yeah, aside from them, I don't know of anyone experiencing a serious uptick. Um, there was an uptick in people making podcasts. But yeah, like I remember we yes. talked about like making sure we were ready for that. And then literally nothing happened. It was an absolute nothing burger as far as the podcast is concerned. So that part of the hype cycle, I'm really glad to be not pursuing this time. That makes it much easier Mm -hmm. to be excited. It takes all the pressure off. (laughs) Because I'm just excited to enjoy watching TV. I'm not excited about Mm -hmm. what it means for my career, you know? (laughs) Right, right, right. Um, But, yeah, I'm excited to see it. It's going to be pretty. Yeah, and I think the thing that excited me the most about the trailer is the number of book scenes I recognized. Yes, I'm like, in just a trailer, we got that much fan service? Holy shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now you combine that with the the fade on the door, which we've seen pictures of, right? Like, that wasn't in the trailer, so... You, You know what broke my brain a little recently? Someone sort of was talking about clothes and how, how clo- clothing is made. And they were like, you know, all clothing's handmade, right? And I went, no, no, there are big factories that make basic clothing. And like, no, there are not. There's no such thing. Clothing is too difficult to automate. They are people on sewing machines making everything you wear ever. Even the cheapest shirts. They're made quickly on big ass machine, you know, big factory sewing machines that run faster than home sewing machines and don't jam up as much as home sewing machines. But it's essentially somebody on a sewing machine making your clothing. And I was like, oh, I thought it was much more automated than that. It's not. No, my mom actually worked in a sweatshop. Um, she she knows exactly what that world is like from the inside. And yeah, the the machinery, she tells me about it when we're she's teaching me how to do home sewing. And she'll tell me about like the differences between industrial machines and how the industrial floors are laid out. And all the cables come down from the ceiling, so there's no tripping hazards and the physical hazards you can run into. And like the things are freaking, the, the motors are always running and you just engage the clutch to like bring the machine right. into it. Like it's a whole different world. Um, and yeah, it's... It is and has always been one of those industries where horrific human rights abuses are happening at a scale that feels archaic and is, in fact, very, very real part of our modern reality. We've just never properly dealt with it. We outsourced it overseas. Yeah. But textile work has always been one of those industries that's just like so much human suffering. 
in making fabric and then making that fabric into garments. It's uh, it's some wild shit. For as little as possible, money wise. Yeah, no, it's um, it, when when if you can, I having sewn your own, if you sew your own garment, and then you imagine someone paying you to do that for them. Even if you scale up to being good at it and not having to undo every step because you're a fucking amateur, like you realize how problematic the prices at the stores are. It's like, mm-hmm. and the stores are are doing like a three thousand percent markup, right? Like they're getting that shit for so little, and like the the whole rise of fast fashion has just been one of one of those things we don't talk about much when we talk about why we can't have nice things and the world is on fire, like. The rate at which clothing is being expected to be produced and the cost and the rate that it's getting purchased at because it's just cheap and I can just get more is like really massive. This is one of the reasons why I still wearing clothes that are like 10 years old. Part of it's because I hate change. Yeah. I just hate change. But part of it's because I just I hate well, I hate shopping also just (laughs) as, as a sensory nightmare. I hate shopping. But like no ethical consumption under capitalism. Yeah. But like if you're if you are scoring your fabric uh, secondhand, gleaning it or getting it secondhand, same for your threads, and you're only like buying needles new and you're sewing your own clothes, they're real damn sturdy and you can repair them and they fit you. It's a huge investment of time, though. Like, that's the thing is it's like. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism. You can hack your way around it, but it costs time. Mm-hmm. You can't use money to hack your way around capitalism. You have to use time, thrifting and sewing and all of that. Like that's that's the only way. And like it's really satisfying, but it's a lot of time to build the skills and it's a lot of time to deploy the skills even once you have them. Well, and I also, when I say no ethical ca- uh, consumption or capitalism, it doesn't mean you can't consume. We all consume. It just means be aware that, you know, consumption is profiting the wrong people. Well, and there are ways to, you know, choose your battles, right? Like as Pants is saying in, in chat, you know, there are certain companies that, you can just wholesale right off and just, I mean, I've haven't purchased, I've never participated in fast fashion. My mom was against it from su- such an early age because she had worked briefly in the sweatshop world. She was like, no, I'm making you clothes and thrifting you clothes. So it's like, it's, it's never been a thing I've had to disengage from, but like, I understand the difficulty, but it's, I mean, I am fascinated by industrial processes and like textile manufacturing is whoo. Oh, and then if you learn look, lean into like learning about labor struggles at all, you will end up in the textile world. Like there are so many specific textile instances in labor struggles. I mean, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire being a quintessential example, but there was one in like Bangladesh like what 5 years ago where a whole ass building just collapsed and killed like hundreds of people and like there have been motions for certain changes in the area about building codes because of that and it's like that you find that pattern repeated across history. <laughs> Well, isn't, isn't that why you're basically, you're not allowed to be locked inside the building you work in for that's that reason? That's the triangle shirt. Right? Right. Like, yeah, that's yeah, why. That like a lot of pe- employers used to lock their employees in to make sure they couldn't leave. And that works until there's a fire and no one can get out because the person with the key is, you know, out at lunch. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a whole ass thing. And the, the neat clothing is very time consuming to make even when you have industrial machinery. As back to your point, which is that all clothes are handmade, like badly and quickly, but yeah, it's too precision for actual automation. Also, have you ever struggled with a fitted sheet? No way automation can do that. <laughs> God, no curves are hard. Turning well, the thing with with sewing, the, the the reality of it. To get back to our earlier discussion about where you were blowing my mind with geometry. The trick with sewing is you are taking a two-dimensional substance and fitting it to a three-dimensional shape. It's fucking Mm -hmm. hard. You are making Mm -hmm. a a dimensional shift of this material because it comes flat. It comes in two dimensions. And you are a fucking three-dimensional asymmetric thing. And figuring out how to make that work is hard. It takes a lot. Which comes back to maps and projections and trying to wrap up map projection around, you know, taking a globe, which is a 
three-dimensional object and projecting it onto a 2D image, and why you're always going to have to distort something, and what you distort is a very important decision that has a lot of political implications. Yep, which is why we should all have globes. I really want a globe. I watched a video a while back about some super uber custom magic globes that take like years to make. And I just want one so bad. So gift list for radio. I mean, not that not that it's a true planet. Like it's not a true planetary shape, but you know, whatever. It's a perfect sphere. It's fine. Well, it's, at that scale, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Is at that scale, would you even be able to notice? No. Would the, would the, would the manufacturing technique be precise enough to have a slightly different vertical versus, you know, horizontal. It's not an oblate spheroid. <laughs> yeah, no. What percentage difference is the diameter of the Earth versus the, I don't know what you call it, vertical axis of the Earth? I don't know, but I do know that Newton calculated it. So it's observable if you're trying to measure things like that from the ground, I think. Gotcha. But... It might only be in the math. I don't know. I mean, I know it matters for like, you know, astronomy and shit. And GPS, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it totally matters. But I do know that Newton is the one who coined the term to describe the planet. So I'm pretty sure it's observable if you're like collecting data from, I don't know, boat people or whoever the fuck he was talking to. But I don't know. Way to disrespect Newton. I mean, he fucking stole his shit. Well, co-opted, collaborated, didn't share credit properly with. Another guy whose name is currently escaping me, but, you know. <laughs> it worked. No, I mean, Brandon's lectured to me about him before. I know his name sometimes. I'm just really baked right now. Uh -huh. Is it Leibniz? I think it was Leibniz. Leibniz, yeah. He had a lot to do with all that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Leibniz. Like, Leibniz had really shitty notation, and Newton made it all pretty and lovely. But, like, Newton was cleaning up Leibniz's stuff. So it is a true collaboration, but, like, we... You know, you have to have a math major for a spouse in order to, like, be clued into that. <laughs> so, eh. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?